Good morning. How are y'all? Uh, as I jump into worship, I want to share a psalm that's been on my heart, and this is Psalm 34, and this is how it starts. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Journey, we have much to celebrate. Whether you had a hard week or a difficult week or maybe a really good and easy week, we have much to celebrate, much to praise. Let us exalt his name together. a few times y'all sing out I see the sun rise in the morning and a million stars at night I hear the birds they can't stop singing hallelujah I see his goodness when I fall down and his grace that picks me up every day I can't stop singing hallelujah how can you not see God in every little thing, in every little moment? How can you not feel loved? How can you not? How can you not? Because he's in the middle of every little thing, in every little moment. How can you not see God? How can you not? How can you not? I see the sun rise and I want just for me. Nobody else can make a world so beautiful. How could I question his love when it's everywhere I go? Whenever I look, I find Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I 
state when everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never Still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I built my life on Jesus. He's never So why?
we want to be mindful of our guests this morning. And if, you've, if this is your first time at Journey, we want to explain that we have stations in the front and in the back for communion. And during the next worship song, uh, our folks will get up, they'll go get their elements, and they'll take communion privately. We do that in community, though. Um, even though we're doing that individually, we do that publicly. Also, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, it says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. That day is his second coming, by the way. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four 24 says, And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There's a couple parts there to that. First of all, there's proclaiming today that you're a part of letting people know in the world by you just simply partaking in communion. You're saying to the world that, that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that you're part of that community of people that believe that. And you're proclaiming that to the world when you, do, when you celebrate together, when you meet together. Also, you're saying, we're going to do this until his coming again, until he appears again. And when he comes, he's going to take us home with him into eternity. Would you pray with me as we get, prepare our hearts for communion? Lord, this morning we are so grateful to be in your house. We come here with intention and purpose, and that is to worship and honor you and to grow in our relationship with you and each other. I pray today that each person that comes would feel welcome, that you invited them to this table the bread symbolizing your body, the juice symbolizing your blood, all that was sacrificed so that we could have a relationship with you. Our broken relationship was repaired because you became the substitute for our sins. Thank you, God, for making it possible for us to know you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. continue our worship um, with the opportunity to give our tithes and offerings. The way that we do that here is there are five different ways that you can give. I won't list them off for you. You can see them on the screen. One of the ways is in the back. Um, if you'd like to give by check or cash, um, you can also um, donate online through the Church Center app or through our website. Um, but I'd like to open us, up and open us up in prayer, and then we can dive into God's word together. God, what an amazing creator you are. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to worship you with your people. 
um, together in this place. We don't take it lightly that we have the freedom to do so. I pray that you will give me your words to speak and that we'll all have hearts to learn and ears to listen and that you'll show us something new today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you've been coming this summer, you know that we are currently in a series called Jesus Followers Just Like Me. And we have been diving into the book of Mark. And Mark is a wonderful um, book that kind of, it's, it's short, so it's an easy book to catch up on if you've missed it so far. But it's a book filled with the joys and wonder of Jesus. That's what I take away from it anyway. It shows his miraculous wonders that he performed while he was here on earth. And so far this, this month, we've learned, this month and last month, we've learned about some of the miracles that he performed um, and some of the parables that he taught. And we will continue that today with Mark 8. But I want to tell you what we're missing. So we're kind of skipping a chunk of Mark in order to get where we are today. And I think there are some highlights that are um, necessary for the context of this particular um, group of scripture. So, so far in, in the things that we've missed, we've missed uh, Jesus's teachings not being accepted in his hometown of Nazareth. So they've, they've not chosen not to believe. We've missed Jesus sending out the 12 to do his work. We have missed Herod killing John the Baptist, Jesus's cousin. That's a pretty big moment um, in Jesus's life, I imagine, um, finding out that his cousin um, had been beheaded. Jesus fed the 5,000 Jews. Uh, so that's a, a big deal. Out of some loaves and fishes, he fed 5,000 people. Jesus walked on water. No big deal. Um, that's, that's a pretty big deal. It kind of freaked the disciples out, I imagine, um, and anybody who saw it. But he, he walked on water. He uh, healed all who touched him. So last week, Darren talked about the hemorrhaging woman and how she reached out to touch his cloak, and he felt the power come out of him, and um, she was healed by her faith. Um, and what we learn in the next couple of chapters is that as he was walking through the towns um, that he had been visiting, people who touched him were being healed. So it sort of became a regular occurrence, um, and he was just letting the power flow. Jesus saved another girl from a demon. So we, we learned that powerful message from Adam a couple of weeks ago, um, and, and he continued to deliver people from demons. And then um, Jesus healed a guy who was deaf and had a speak imp speech impediment. And uh, he uh, did so just willingly and, um, and because of the guy's faith. So now where we're going to be at is Jesus and his disciples are in a place called Decapolis, which is, it means 10 cities. It's not a big deal. There's just a grouping of 10 cities. And people from far and wide have come to learn from him. And what is interesting about this particular crowd is it's a non-Jewish Gentile crowd. So they didn't grow up in the church, so to speak. They may not be familiar with the words that Jesus is teaching from the Hebrew scriptures or what we call the Old Testament. And so the things that they are hearing from him are fairly new. And he is slowly transforming their lives by what he's teaching them. And he's been there for three days teaching them. So let's pick up in Mark 8, um, verse 1. And if you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in front of you. I always tell the kids in Kids Church to bring their Bibles, their real solid Bibles. If you don't have a solid Bible, please take one and, and use it and bring it to church with you and write in it and write notes. Um, we'd love for you to, to open the scripture with us. But we're going to be in Mark, which is the second book of the New Testament. And we're going to be in chapter 8, which I actually marked. Verse 1. During those days, another loud crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. 
His disciples answered, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? Well, how many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and they were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up about seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 men were present and having sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanatha. All right, so let's talk about what we just learned. The biggest thing that stands out to me is Jesus had compassion for his people. Now remember, Jesus was fully human and fully God. So he understood what it, mean to, what it meant to be hungry. Has anybody ever been hungry before? Really hungry. Some of us have. Some of us have experienced extreme bouts of hunger. Um, and Jesus understood that people really aren't at their best when they're hungry. We're not firing on all cylinders, right? When we're hungry and we're, we're thinking about food and our stomachs are telling us, you need to eat. So he was fully human and fully God and he knew that food provided energy. And he was concerned that these people who had traveled from very far places might pass out on the way home. It's a legitimate concern because they didn't have cars, okay? And there probably weren't many buckies on the way from their place to home, okay? So they couldn't just stop at 7-Eleven. They needed to be fed. And he knew that they had to be fed spiritually and in a human way as well. Yes, he was there to do the kingdom work that God had called him to do. He was there to teach them but he had to feed them earthly food too. And and he had compassion. So one of the things I want you to take away from today is to remember that Jesus knows what it's like to be human. He knows what it's like to experience the things that we experience because Jesus was human. I think we forget that sometimes because we we tend to, to focus on the fact that he's God. But I really want you to remember that he can have compassion because he truly understands what it's like to be one of us. And not only did he show compassion because he's just a compassionate being, I believe that he was trying to teach the disciples to be compassionate for people as well. Remember, this was a non-Jewish crowd, so there were people that hadn't really learned the scriptures. They, didn't, they weren't like the disciples necessarily, who many of them had been raised in a Jewish household. Um, and so the, the disciples may have struggled a little bit in serving them and seeing them as fully human. That's not so different than us sometimes, is it? We look at the other, and we don't, necessarily see them with compassion, the way that Christ sees us with compassion, except that this church does. We have a ministry called Journey to the Streets. How many of you all know what Journey to the Streets is? It is a beautiful ministry that serves the homeless population of Waco. And and what they do is they don't just seek out once a month to to feed them. Phyllis does this every day of her life. I I, I can't think of a moment that I've I've known Phyllis that she hasn't been thinking about how she can serve the homeless population in our community. She goes out on the daily and she meets with them and she talks with them and she shares their needs with us. Um, And she, she gives us the opportunities to provide them with our earthly needs. Sometimes it's that they're in the hospital receiving medical care and can we help them with that? Or um, sometimes it's food. Can we provide them with a good meal? Um, And sometimes it's just a listening ear. How many of us sometimes just need a friend to listen 
to what's happening in our hearts and how we need somebody to just say, I hear you. Phyllis and Journey to the Streets does that with our homeless population. She sees them as human beings made in God's image. She doesn't see them with tattered clothes or with smells. She sees them as God sees them and she has compassion for them. We all should. We should be chomping at the bit to serve in Journey to the Streets. Desperate to serve God's people in a very tangible way. And also, show them Christ's hope and love. It's a beautiful opportunity, and I'm not, I, I didn't plan on advertising Journey to the Streets, but it is a really great way to show God's compassion for his people. And so if you're looking for a way to do that, um, I, I definitely encourage you to find Journey to the Streets. But I want to ask you, when you see people, do you see them as God sees them? Or do you see them as different? Maybe they have different politics than you. Can you still show them compassion? Maybe they have a different skin color. Maybe they're poorer than you or richer than you. Can you still see them as people made in God's image? Because that's what transforming lives means. It means seeing them as God sees them, not seeing them with earthly eyes, but seeing them with heavenly eyes, recognizing that God wants to transform all of us, not just people who are churched. So to be his hands and feet, if you will. All right, so the other thing I want to focus on in this particular passage is that the people were so caught up in what Jesus was teaching that they put their physical hunger on the back burner. They didn't get up and leave because they were hungry. They were desperate to hear what he had to say. It was like they, they knew that perhaps he would take care of their physical needs. Now, it's possible that he had taught them um, about how he was going to take care of them already, like they did in Matt. He taught a parable in Matthew. So I'm going to tell you what he said in Matthew. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet... Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And then Jesus says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Seek first his kingdom. And then he'll take care of the rest. Are we seeking first his kingdom? I can't answer for you. That's something that you're going to need to think about and wonder. Are, am I seeking his kingdom first? Am I kingdom minded? Because the reality is, is that our, our life here on earth is pretty short, especially considering that we have an eternity to look forward to. And so it would make sense for us to seek his kingdom first, because most of our life is going to be sent, spent in his kingdom. And to be heavenly minded makes it a lot easier to show compassion for his people. Seek first his kingdom, and then he'll take care of you. He'll take care of the rest. Does that mean that you won't have trouble? No, it doesn't. 
And we may not see the light at the end of the tunnel. We may feel very desperate sometimes. In your desperation, call out to God. He's compassionate for you. He made you. That's no small thing. He formed you in your mother's womb. He knit you together in his image and likeness. If you just thought about that every day and reminded yourself every day that that is who you are, you're not how the world defines you. You're not even how you define you. You're how God defines you. Seek first his kingdom and he'll take care of it. He's already won. Okay. So then Jesus has an interesting conversation with some people called the Pharisees. Now Pharisees are um, Jewish leaders who were particularly interested in power and authority. So they walked around like they were powerful and people treated them as such. They treated them with um, almost fear, I would say, because they acted so powerful. Um, And Jesus has a little discussion with some Pharisees and I'd like to talk about that for a second. Hold on. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? I tell you the truth, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. Now, this interaction is a little bit different than the interaction we saw with the Gentile crowd. So keep in mind that he had just fed 4,000 men and the women and children that were also with them. So he just performed a miracle. He'd been traveling throughout all of the land performing miracles. And then the Pharisees come up to him and say, show me a sign. Okay, so Jesus clearly grieves their unbelief. He he sighs. So this reminds me of a song, and I don't remember who who wrote the song, but it's called Sign, and I'm not going to sing it. You're welcome. But it says, sign, sign, everywhere a sign, blocking out the scenery, breaking my mind. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the sign? He's doing all of, he's performing all of these signs of who he is and the power and the authority that he has within him. And the Pharisees still demand a personal sign. And just as, just as the compassion stood out in that first section, the sigh is what stands out to me in this section. He deeply sighs. Can anyone relate to that? where you're saying the same thing over and over and over again, and people still don't get it. And you're just like, (sighs) and what's interesting about this particular interaction is I imagine Jesus was still compassionate because he's compassionate, but he was probably also a bit frustrated. And so he says, I don't understand this generation, which I feel like every generation says that of the generation that comes after them. They don't understand. What's wrong with this generation? Um, I have to explain things over and over and over again. You know what? I'm not giving you a sign. Then he turns around, gets in his boat and goes away. And so they're just standing at the shore, I imagine, watching his boat go away and wondering like, what, what the heck just happened? Jesus just walked away from us. He said no. Guess what? God gets to say no. We might not like it, but God gets to tell us no. Sometimes his answer is no. Even if we ask over and over and over again, 
He's not going to change his mind. Can you accept that Jesus is real from the signs that you see around you? One of the songs we sang this morning talks about how could you not know God? How could you not? Every little thing and every little moment. It's all around us. That gets me every time. There is evidence all around you that God exists. You have but to open your eyes and see. Don't be blinded by earthly desires for what you think should be the sign. The sign's there. Reach out and grab it. And that's, I think, what he was trying to tell the Pharisees. Guys, I have shown you that I am the fulfillment of prophecy in the Hebrew scriptures time and time again. Why can't you accept all of the previous signs? Because we're stubborn human beings. We can be, am I the only one who's stubborn? Who, we are all stubborn in some way. My husband is like, you're stubborn. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm stubborn. I am an only child. Things like that happen. We're stubborn. We're set in our ways. We don't have our eyes set on kingdom things. Because of that, we demand signs from God, even though he's shown us himself over and over and over again. Walk outside tomorrow morning as the sun rises. How could you not see God? You don't look at a painting and say, that just happened. There's an artist behind it. You'll have to answer for yourself who that artist is. But as Christians, our belief is that God created the world and us. Just open your eyes and see. Unfortunately, we are like the Pharisees and we, we do dwell on the fact that maybe he hasn't moved quickly enough in our lives or... Um, I think when I was in high school, if I was taking like a hard test, I'd be, I'd be like, God, please just let me get an A on this and I'll do whatever you want. And that would be the sign, right? The A would be the sign. I don't, yeah. We demand him in other ways. We try to make deals with God. The thing is, God's not a deal maker. He's a way maker. He doesn't want to make a deal with you. The deal's already done. There's no deal to be made. Why waste your time trying to make a deal with someone who wrote history? It's not going to change the path. He's completed his end of it. He knows what's going to happen. Trust him. Trust him every day. I think this is why in movies, we don't often see, we see people pleading with God, but we don't often see people um, making deals with God. Who do we see people making deals with? The devil. A lot of times in movies and songs, they're making deals with Satan. It's like they know they can't make a deal with God. The Pharisees clearly <laughs> didn't know, <laughs> but we as humans should know, we should recognize that we, we can't make a deal with God. So let's look at the last portion. And this one deals with the disciples. And I think that this was a bit of a frustrating conversation with Jesus too. But let's see what happens. I'm in verse 14. The disciples had for forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it's because we don't have any bread. <sighs> yeah. 
Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Ah, the disciples, they're just like us. Truly, he picked them and they're just like us. They got to see Jesus in real time, performing miracles every day. And still they didn't get it. It doesn't say he deeply sighed here. I imagine there was a deep sigh. Because, come on. They saw the feeding of the 5,000. They saw the feeding of the 4,000. And they're concerned that Jesus isn't going to feed them. Yeah. So he says something weird here. Jesus does. Um, Sorry, Jesus. He says something weird here. He talks about the leaven and he tells them not to fall for the leaven of the Pharisees or that of Herod. So how many of y'all are bakers? Just a few. All right. So bread. Bread the really delicious, fluffy, squishy kind has yeast in it, right? And it rises and it gets beautiful, right? There's nothing like freshly baked bread, right? Terry Binder, Jackie makes amazing freshly baked bread. He's talking about the yeast, which is um, something that transforms something else. So it makes bread bread, right? And so he's warning them, the disciples, about bad yeast. He had just had this interaction with the Pharisees, which the disciples no doubt saw. And he's warning them not to fall for whatever the the Pharisees are trying to teach them. Now, this would have been countercultural because they had probably been taught as good Jewish boys to follow what the Pharisees or the Jewish leaders would say. No doubt they'd been told that by the Pharisees themselves. Like, listen to me, dude. And Jesus was telling him, don't fall for what they say. Do not be transformed by what they teach you. And they didn't get it. They thought he was talking about bread. He was talking about bread, but he wasn't talking about bread. He was talking about us being transformed. We're not to be transformed by things of this world. Pick your Pharisee of the day. What are you allowing to transform your life? It should be kingdom things. Because if you're seeking God's kingdom first, that's what's going to transform you. But if it's not kingdom things, you are being transformed by something else. What is it? I don't know. I can't answer that for you. Do not be transformed by things of this world. Be transformed by heavenly things. He was trying to teach them that. They didn't quite get it. So I'm imagining Jesus is sort of like the mother who says, like, if I've told you once, I've told you a hundred times. Come on. You've heard me speak this. Like, We traveled together and they still didn't get it. And we're kind of like that. Sometimes we need to be told things over and over and over again in order to understand. Jesus shows them compassion a little bit, but he's also a little bit like, okay, we need to move forward here. We need to start understanding what it is I'm doing because I'm gonna drop some pretty big bombs in a couple of chapters and you're gonna need to know what I'm talking about. I have compassion for the disciples 
Because honestly, when I read this scripture for the first time, I didn't know what Jesus was talking about. And I'm sure a lot of what he was teaching was brand new to them too. So show compassion for the disciples because we're just like them. And we're going to have to ask questions. And we shouldn't be afraid to ask questions. But we should ask good questions. I think we're kind of like all of the people represented in this first section of Mark. We're like the crowd. We're spiritually hungry and we need to be fed. And the good news is, Jesus is the bread of life. He'll feed you. Just ask. Trust him. Lean not on your own understanding. Be heavenly minded. We're a bit like the Pharisees. We don't always trust what we see even if we see it over and over and over again, we still demand a sign that God will move in our lives or that God will be faithful to us when really we're the ones who need to remind ourselves to be faithful to him. And we're a bit like the disciples. We see and yet we do not understand. But Jesus doesn't give up on us. He continues to shape us and mold us so long as we allow him to. So long as we give him the opportunity, he will continue to invest in us because he believes in us. He wants to spend eternity with us. It's why he came in the first place. So this week, I want you to reflect on the fact that Christ is compassionate toward us. He grieves our unbelief, and yet he doesn't give up on us. As you reflect on this passage this week, it's Mark 8. Write it down. Go read it. Um, I want you to see where you fit in. Yes, we're kind of like all three groups, but I'm sure there's somewhere that you fit in in particular in your own life. Maybe you're like the crowd, and you just need to be spiritually fed. You could do that. Read your scriptures, pray, commune with other Christians. Maybe you're like the Pharisees and you've been demanding a sign. The signs are all around you. Read them. And maybe, maybe you're like the disciples and you've seen the signs but you still don't get it. You still don't understand. The good news is that Jesus came to earth so that you would understand. He died on the cross so that you would understand. He was resurrected three days later so that you would understand. He ascended to heaven so that you would understand. He did all of those things so that you would understand so that you could spend eternity with the one who formed you in the womb. If you need hope, there's your hope. Find your hope in that right there. If you want to talk more about hope, I'm happy to talk to you about that too. Um, I know any of our pastors would be happy to talk to you about the hope that you can find in Christ. I'd like to... Um, close with prayer. Um, And there's not going to be ministry time today, but if you need somebody to pray with you, please find me or one of the other pastors, and we'd be happy to pray with you. But I want to spend a moment thinking about where we fit in in this narrative. Who are you in this story? Find yourself in it, and then respond accordingly. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all the signs, all the wonders. We admit that 
we often don't understand. And I pray that you will continue to reveal yourself to us in very real ways so that there's no excuse. I pray that you will give us opportunities this week to show compassion to your people. I pray that we will have eyes to see and ears to hear all that you want us to know and that we will be transformed by you, not by the things of this world. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for hope. Thank you for joy and peace and love and the fruits of the Spirit. Thank you for creating us and loving us despite our ways. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I have a few announcements, but first I want to tell you that next week is a little bit of a spoiler alert. We're going to still be in Mark 8, but we're going to hear about Peter's confession and rebuke. And I'll give you another spoiler. He still doesn't understand. And Jesus is like, come on, man. And there's a rebuke. Um, So it's really fascinating to watch Jesus interact with Peter in that. But if you want to skip ahead, read the rest of Mark and you'll find out. And then in two weeks, Landon is back. Uh, I feel like his sabbatical has just gone by so fast. So we've got two weeks until he comes back and that's very exciting. So make sure you join us in two weeks. Um, But I have a few announcements. Um, First is Journey U. Journey U is something that we do here in the summer. We're two weeks We've been two weeks in, now we've got two weeks left. Um, It's never too late to join us though. If you just wanna tap in and learn something new, um, we've got two more weeks to go. Uh, You can find out more information about Journey U on the Church Center app or our website, or you can ask any of us, um, the pastoral staff, about what to expect at Journey U. There's lots of different opportunities to learn there. Um, VBS starts in about a week. Um, (laughs) Yes, Um, we have... Roughly 100 kids registered, um, which is fantastic. That's, we're ahead of where we have been in the past. So that's very exciting and nerve wracking. So um, I am gonna give you the opportunity to jump in and join us. We are looking for adults in particular who are willing to help us with VBS. We need some co-leaders for some of the crews that we're gonna have. There's gonna be a lot of kids and I would rather not have teenagers in charge of all of the kids. Um, So the more adults that we have as helping hands, the better. And it doesn't require a lot of training or anything like that. If you have questions, please join us. Um, And and on Wednesday, I think at 6, I have a meeting. So you can join us here at the church and we can talk about it and see where you can plug in. Um, You can also register your four-year-olds to your fourth graders. And uh, they're going to learn a little bit about space and a little bit about God's creation and who um, God formed them to be. And, and I, I'm really excited about it, and I hope you are too. And then um, the other thing is that with VBS, we, are, we always have a goal of things that we'd like to do, and it usually results in me getting slimed. Um, and this year, we are adopting Journey to the Streets as our ministry, and we are going to make 200 blessing bags for Journey to the Streets. And so I'll be releasing a list of supplies that y'all can bring in um, even starting next Sunday to help the kids kind of reach their goal. Um, And um, then we will give all those blessing bags to Phyllis and Phyllis and her team can distribute them um, to the homeless population here in Waco. So if y'all could stand with me, um, I'd love to bless you. Journey, this week, I really want you to remember that God has compassion towards you. He understands you and he loves you. Be kingdom-minded, thinking, thing, thinking about things not of this earth, but of what to expect in eternity. And then share that hope with others. With that, let's walk together and make a difference. How could you not, how could you not, cause he's in the middle of every little thing and every little moment. How could you not see God? How could you not, how could you not, how could you not see God? Every little thing and every little moment. How could you not see God? How could you not, how could you not, I see the sunrise in the morning and a
stars at night. I hear the birds, they can't stop singing, hallelujah. 